coming up next on Living on the Edge. God says, I know the end from the beginning. My titles, my promises, and prophecy all declare that I'm the sovereign Lord, the unique one. Hi, I'm Chip Ingram with Living on the Edge. And you know, it's very unpopular in our day to believe there's one true God, the God of the Bible. Is that intellectually defensible? And how do you respond to that? Well, that's today on Living on the Edge. You'll want to stay with me. For some of you, you've probably heard this word a lot, but I had never heard this word until I was uh, about 20 years old. A, a friend of mine was in an accident. He was paralyzed from the waist down. Uh, we were praying that he would live because the doctor said there was little chance. And as we were praying, there was a girl in the group that she obviously knew God way more than me. And I remember hearing her pray, God, in the midst of all of this, I thank you that you're sovereign and that you will somehow, some way, bring good out of this. And I don't know if you've ever been in a prayer meeting and heard someone pray and you thought, you know, I wonder what that means. And so I went to a guy that I kind of trusted and I said, what, what's sovereign? I've never heard that word. What's it mean? Well, sometimes good Bible study starts with the dictionary. Notice I put what Webster's, it means someone who's above all, who's superior, the greatest, the chief, the supreme power, the ranking authority, one without equal, one who is excellent, someone who possesses absolute control. I put some synonyms in there. He's the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. He calls the shots. He's the ultimate authority. He's without, think of this, without limits, and God is absolutely free. No one tells him what to do. There are no competitors. He's not looking for any teammates. You can agree or disagree, but as we go through Scripture, here's what you need to understand. God is the lone, sole, sovereign, king authority. Before there was anything, there was this personal, powerful, self-sufficient, infinite, loving, holy God who by his nature is truth, who never changes. And scripture after scripture after scripture, if you would want to kind of explode your mind if you went to that front page later today and you just got a good cup of coffee or tea and put your feet up and if you looked up each verse and read it slowly, I mean, you would read things like, you are before all things. I am the Lord, that is my name. There's none before me. I have created the heavens of the earth, the visible and the invisible. Thrones and dominions and powers, all are under mine. I speak and it comes to being. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, who was and is and will be. God says, I am the unique source creator of all that there is, all that there was, all that there will ever be. You will pray differently if you would see God for who he is. The bottom of your notes, I tried to summarize the implications. I mean, when we say he's sovereign, I kind of took what I've learned and I put it in a couple paragraphs. Pull out your pen because I want you to underline one line. The sovereignty of God is that which separates the God of the Bible from all other religions, truth claims, and philosophies. Completely separate. Why? When we say God is sovereign, we declare by virtue of his creatorship over all of life and reality, his all-knowing, all-powerful, benevolent rule, that he is in fact the Lord of lords and the king of all kings, and put a little squiggly line under this, and in absolute control of time and eternity. There are no accidents. There is nothing random. He is ultimately in control. And then underline the next line because this is where the great comfort comes for those who choose to follow the living God. Nothing will come into my life today that is either allowed or decreed for my ultimate good. There's not a circumstance, not a person, not a job loss, not cancer, not a relationship, not a betrayal, not an injustice, not a terrorist act. There's nothing that will enter your life that's not either decreed by God, this is his will, or allowed by God, we'll learn that he's allowed for a season of time, limited evil and limited suffering, and we'll learn why. 
But for those, not for everyone, but for those who say, I want to follow you, he says, I will orchestrate even the evil, the betrayal, the worst things that can happen to your life, I will weave them in a way to bring about your ultimate good. That's huge. That's the sovereignty of God. So now what I want to do is I want to kind of give you some biblical background and let you know that I just didn't make this up. And so how has God revealed his sovereignty? First, through his titles. He's not one among the gods. His titles in Scripture are Sovereign Lord, Most High, Alpha and Omega, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So there's a claim. You don't have to believe it. But the God of the Bible is not like, I'm one of the gods on the salad bars that you can choose from. There's no syncretism with the God of the Bible. It doesn't fit with any other ism or thought. He says, I am the absolute ruler in control. Second, through his promises. God makes promises in Scripture that demand that he is sovereign, that he's in control, that he has authority, that he's aware not only of what is, not only knows all things, but knows the possibility of all things. Romans 8, 28 was another thing I heard prayed as we uh, circled around together as our good friend was dying and we were begging God for his life. And someone else prayed. I was a very new Christian. I, didn't, I couldn't pray any verses because I didn't know any. And someone else prayed, God, I want to thank you, Romans 8, 28, that you work all things together for a very special group of those who love you, of those who are called according to your purpose. For those people who have surrendered and saying, I'm following Jesus as my Messiah, the promise is God some way, some while, over time, is gonna orchestrate it for your good. How do you make that promise unless you're in absolute control? Or Philippians chapter two makes outrageous claims about God the Son. It says that God the Son, therefore, it says that Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess of those in heaven, of those on earth, and those under the earth that every single person who has ever lived, every angel that's been ever created, anyone or anything, Satan, demons, everything and everyone will bow their knee to the Lord Jesus as Lord of Lord and kings of kings and confess him as Lord. How can you make that outrageous claim? unless you're the sovereign Lord. The third way he reveals his sovereignty is through prophecy. You may not be aware of it, but especially at the time of its writing, a third of all the Bible is prophetic. I mean, one full third is God predicting with specificity and 100% accuracy, this is what's going to happen. In Isaiah 44, we read it earlier in our worship time, um, the Lord in that day had the same issue with people that he has now. Well, we've got Baal, we've got Moloch, you've got your gods, we've got ours. Our gods cause the rain, we worship the moon. Hey, Israel, what makes you think your God is bigger or better than our God? And God speaks to the prophet Isaiah and he said, from ancient times I have predicted with 100% accuracy what would happen when and why. Tell their gods to tell you exactly what's going to happen in the future and be right 100% of the time. Let's see how that goes. That's sort of the Chip Ingram translation of Isaiah 44, 6 through 8. A hundred years before a man named Cyrus was born, God predicted that he would be the key liberator of the children of Israel. He spoke to a young man named Daniel who was taken out of exile as a teenager and then he went through the Babylonian, Medo-Persian, and for three different governments, he was a, an official who had God's favor. Daniel knew that God had promised a deliverance from the exile, that he would gather his people back, and as he was praying and asking God, make it clear, make it clear. clear. In Daniel 7 through 12, God gives to a human being the next four kingdoms that would occur in advance. He said, Daniel, Babylonians are going to be taken over by the Medo-Persians. The Medo-Persians will be taken over by the Greeks. There will be this one great leader who will rule the world. Alexander the Great is the reference. And then it will break into four kingdoms. If you know history, four different generals. After those four different generals, there will be another one, and it will be Rome. Hundreds of years, God lays out in advance. Why? So ordinary people like you and me could say, I can trust the God of Scripture. 
He has predicted with specific accuracy exactly what's going to happen. In fact, liberal scholars, when they look at the book of Daniel, what they do is they say, you know what? It couldn't have been written here. We have to move it forward hundreds of years, and he must have saw what happened and made it up, except it's not plausible. And history and all of the documents don't support it. God says, I know the end from the beginning. My titles, my promises, and prophecy all declare that I'm the sovereign Lord, the unique one. You're watching Living on the Edge with Chip Ingram. Chip will be back with the rest of his message in just a minute. If you're new to us, Living on the Edge is an international teaching and discipleship ministry dedicated to helping Christians really live like Christians. To view additional broadcasts, visit us at livingontheedge.tv. Now let's join Chip for the rest of today's message. Fourth and maybe most profound is his sovereignty is revealed through Christ. He has a supernatural birth. And not simply, of course, it's from a virgin. But a supernatural birth is sovereignty means God orchestrates all the different things of the world at just the right time, both in your personal life for kingdoms and for his purposes. Job would say one day, I know, O Lord, that you can do all things, and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Galatians 4.4 4 is in your notes. You might circle that and read it later. It says, in the fullness of time, God brought forth his son. His sovereignty allowed Jesus to fulfill not only a perfect life, but hundreds of prophecies. Jesus in his teaching, he didn't say, I'm a good teacher. I'm, I'm one of the many good teachers, and I'm a good way uh, in terms of a model to follow. He said, I'm the sovereign king of the universe. The whole book of Matthew is, I have fulfilled all that God said. I am God. Before Abraham was, I am. He claimed to be the king, and he claimed to bring a kingdom. By the way, he was never killed by anyone. He's king. He's sovereign. He says, I lay down my life and I take it up. And finally, this king says, I came first as a suffering servant. But I will come back as a righteous judge. Some of us have experienced things that are so horrendous. And the question in your heart and mine has been, God, if you're good, how could you allow that to happen? We've watched videos of ISIS and say, oh God, how could you allow that to happen? We've been betrayed by spouses. You've lived a great life and had cancer. I know someone who saved up their whole life, had a great life and got ready to retire, had a massive heart attack. There's injustice. There's evil in the world. And Jesus said, there's a limited time for evil and suffering. But he says, when I come back, I will not come as a suffering servant to pay for your sins. I will come back as a righteous judge and I will give everyone exactly what they deserve. And that's why for each one of us, I want to hide under the righteousness of Christ. I want the forgiveness that God gives me through what Jesus did so that when I come back, I and my standing will be not in my works or my righteousness, but in my relationships with Jesus, my Savior. In Revelation 19 we get a picture that's very specific of the Lord's return at the end of time. Follow along as I read and see the difference between Jesus calling the children to himself and the righteous judge. I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judge and makes war. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood and the name by which he is called is the word of God. On his robe and on his thigh has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So at this point, I have no idea how you used to think about God, but here's what you gotta know. He's way bigger, totally in control, and he is awesome, and he causes us to surrender and bow because he is the one. But here's what I want you to get. As high, holy, and exalted as God is, the sovereignty of God is one of the greatest comforts in all the world. So I've kind of given you the facts. I've given you the basis. When God chose in the very first book of the Bible to handle one of the most difficult things to understand, how could a good God allow evil and suffering, and how does all that fit together, he did it in the very first book. 
The last way, and I think the most encouraging, at least for me, that God demonstrates and reveals his sovereignty is through redeeming the pain in our lives. It's when he takes things that were meant for evil and he turns them around and makes them good. Uh, In the book of Genesis, you have the, the core doctrines, all the major ones. So you have the creator, and then you have the fall, the reason for sin and evil. Then you have a flood, you have initial judgment. Then you have a, a new race and you have God choosing Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob. And you have this family line that God's going to work through people. Now you've got 50 chapters and the last 13 are about one man, Joseph. Think of that. Over 25% of the very first book of the Bible is about one man. Why? Because it answers the question of how does a good, kind God deal with the evil and injustice and the communication is because he is sovereign and in control he can take even the evil that's purposed toward you personally or toward a nation or toward a life and because he's in control he can use it for good how many of you feel like you kind of know the story of Joseph it'll tell me okay about half I didn't grow up reading the Bible so I didn't know much of it so for those of us that don't know that much here's the story He's the youngest son. His father shows favoritism, so his brothers hate him. So his brothers put him in a pit, and they're ready to kill him. But just so happens, or sovereignly, a caravan comes by of Egyptians, and they say, why kill him when we get some money? We'll sell him to the Egyptians. They take his robe that's super-duper stuff, puts it in a little bit of blood from a dead animal, takes it to dad, and say, your son's been killed. Joseph now, it's unjust. He's uh, taken on this caravan. He gets on the auction block as a slave. And a man named Potiphar, who's sort of like the head of the secret service for Pharaoh, uh, decides he'll buy him. So he's a slave, so he gets bought, and he goes to Potiphar's house. All along, if you would read 37 to 50, those chapters, all along, I mean, circumstances are bad, they're difficult, they're unjust, but Joseph keeps pictured on the promise God gave him. One day, remember that dream? This is what you're going to do. And so he hangs in there. Well, he has this administrative gift so that, I mean, everything he touches organizationally, it flourishes. So Potiphar goes, you know, tell you what, take over my business, take over my household, run everything, and it just flourishes. Well, he's a very good-looking young guy. And so Potiphar's wife says, you know why my husband's at work? We could have a lot of fun. And, and so come on, have sex with me. And I don't know, most men would go, this sounds like a really good idea, and I got a raw deal, and this is He goes, no, no, I would betray your husband, I betray the God of heaven. And so he rebuffs her, rebuffs her. Finally, he's one day doing a little work in the house and no one's around, and she says, come lay with me, come lay with me. And so he, again, does what most men would never do. He literally runs and she grabs his jacket and he leaves and she's got the jacket and she's humiliated. And so the husband comes home and she says, you brought this dirty Hebrew into our house, he tried to rape me, so now he goes to prison. I mean, it goes from bad, bad, bad to worse. So now... You know, his brothers disown him. He's sold as a slave. He ends up, things get a little bit better. Now he's in prison. He goes to prison, and his administrative gifts show up, and pretty soon the people say, you know what, why don't you run this prison? You're one of the guards, but you run this thing. Well, it goes great. And then there's a couple guys in the kingdom, a baker and a cupbearer, and apparently they both had a bad day, and so they're sentenced into the prison, and Joseph meets them, and they have a dream, each of them. And they go, oh, boy, I wonder what this dream means. And Joseph says, you know, God has given me ability to interpret dreams. And so he interprets the dreams. He says to the one guy, hey, you're going to get restored to your position. The other guy, it's going to be pretty bad. You die tomorrow. And both of them come true. (laughs) And so then he says to him, hey, guys, hey, guys, look, my brothers did this. This wife did this. You know, falsely accused. I'm in prison. Amen. Remember me, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, we will. Well, they forget him. So years go by. And finally, Pharaoh has a dream. And Pharaoh has this dream he doesn't understand, and so his sorcerers and magicians and his wise men, no one can figure it out. So he goes, hey, I got an idea. Either you come and explain the dream, tell me what I dreamed and how it happens, or I'm going to kill everybody. So this cupbearer says, you know, this would be a good time to remember Joseph. So Joseph gets a shave, comes in, comes before the Pharaoh. Pharaoh, this is what you dreamed, seven years of great abundance, seven years of famine. It's going to be global. It's going to be bad. You better have a great plan, store stuff up. And Pharaoh goes, great, you're the man. So he goes from the prison to the number two power in the world. And then his administrative gifts, Pharaoh gets very rich. He has all this grain stockpiled. And then the famine comes. And when the famine comes, his brothers and father, there's about 70 of them, they don't have any food, and so they come to Egypt. And I'll let you read the whole story, but eventually it breaks his heart. By now, he's married an Egyptian wife. He has two sons that he names 
that really reveal the pain and the hurt and the difficulty that he's been through. And he forgives his brothers. And he realizes, you know, and all that pain and all that difficulty, I mean, it was bad, 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 worse, terrible. And then he realized, God sent me here to save the nation of Israel. So all 70 come, they get this peace of land in Goshen, and, and they become an incubator for the purposes of God, and they go from 70 people to two or three million in the next three to 400 years. It's the end of his father's life, he's dying, and the brothers, being the good, upstanding, high men of integrity they are, say something like, you know why dad was here, Joseph didn't kill us, but I'm sure he's gonna kill us now, and so they start, and this is again, you can read this for yourself, but write in your notes the 50-20 principle. This is the great hope that you have, the great hope I have, because God is powerful and awesome and creator and holy and judge, but he is a kind, tender father who is sovereign. And he turns to his brothers, and I have to, I just believe that there was a tear running down his cheek, and he said, brothers, you didn't send me here, God did. What you did was wrong, but here's the word, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good to bring about this present result, all these people alive. And the sovereignty of God in your life and in my life means not for everyone, but for those that are followers of Yahweh, those who are followers of Jesus, those who say, I wanna follow you. The promise is other people can mean it. They can walk out on you, mean it for evil. You, You can get a raw deal at work. You can get cancer in a fallen world. Terrible things can happen. But as you lean in and walk, God promises, I will use it for good. Last night, my wife, she comes to Saturday Night Usually and sat on the front row, and I just spontaneously thought, you know what, my wife was married as a non-Christian, a guy started selling drugs, found out that my wife that he was married to uh, was pregnant, who's already having an affair, and he leaves to another state and he abandons my wife. He meant it for evil. Out of her despair, her boss leads her to Christ. God meant it for good. I got to marry her. She's awesome. I got to adopt two little boys that are my sons that I've seen God change and grow. And Why? Because God's sovereign. My hope is God's sovereign. I remember when she got cancer and I thought, oh, God. And, you know, we had, a, you know, we had, had to work hard on our marriage, but it was like, I, I, I felt like, man, after, you know, 30-some years early. This is, this is a great relationship. And then I remember driving her to every single appointment at Stanford. And it's just like, I remember we'd always stop at a Starbucks and get one oatmeal cookie and break it in half off of those treatments and have a cup of coffee. And I remember looking in the little car and going, I, didn't, I couldn't dream that I could love her and appreciate her if I get another month, another year, another two years. God can take the worst that you'll ever experience in your life, and if you lean in, and if you ask him, he can bring good out of it, no matter who does it for evil. One of our teammates was in um, Greece in a refugee camp, and in that refugee camp, um, there was just tens of thousands of people fleeing from Syria and the Middle East, and this pastor who's worked with Islam for like 30 years starts praying, God, I thank you for ISIS, I thank you for ISIS, I thank you for ISIS, and it was like, what? And she looked up and said, where are you coming from? God meant it for evil. There is a movement across all of Islam of people that are completely disillusioned that are coming to Christ in ways we never, ever dreamed. I have a a friend, a young man that we just got to help who's in Germany right now, and we email, and I'm kind of aware of what's going on. He said, Chip, you can't imagine what God is doing. They meant it for evil, but people are seeing things for what they are. What is it in your life? What is it in your life that you would say, this is hard, difficult, terrible, and you're trying to control and manipulate and make work out, in which God would say, I'm a sovereign God. Would you be willing to trust me Would you lean in? Would you walk with me? As we close our time together, I want to challenge you to really ponder, how would God want you to respond to his sovereignty? 
I think there's three very specific ways that each one of us must respond to the sovereignty of God. First and foremost, we need to bow before his sovereignty. It's about realizing that Jesus will indeed come back. He's the Lord of lords and the King of kings, and every knee will bow. If we don't do that willfully now in surrender and submission, we will bow with the whole world before him later, unwillfully. So let me just encourage you, bow before him now from a surrendered heart. Second, believe that everything that enters in your life is either decreed or allowed by God. Can you imagine? I mean, everything that comes into your life, it's that Joseph moment where because he understands God's sovereignty, he says, they meant it for evil, but God meant it for good to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Now, I know that's hard, and I've shared some tough stories out of my own life, and I know you've had some hard times too, but you can actually refuse to worry you can actually rest in the fact that though you don't understand it all, God's in control. He's sovereign. He's got your back. He's good. He's going to work the hardest things in your life for your benefit. And finally, this last application is a little harder for some of us, but I want to encourage you to behold the majesty and the sovereignty of God by becoming a worshiper. Build in times of singing to Him. Read the Psalms out loud. If you play an instrument, come before God and just celebrate who He is. I think you'll find that your view of God in your heart will begin to expand. You'll discover the comfort and the freedom that comes from embracing the sovereignty of God. He's the real God and He loves you. And here's the good part, He's in control. Now here's Chip with an important message. I don't know about you, but family devotions were always a pretty big challenge in my life. Uh, we would finish dinner and then I would try to impart my best spiritual truth to my kids while they were fidgeting and pretty soon they're rolling their eyes. It just didn't work out all that well all the time. That's why the team at Living on the Edge has decided to create a family devotional and we did it in a way that kids want to participate and they really want to learn. That's why I'm excited about The Real God Family Devotional. This completely free online resource features streaming videos plus downloadable discussion guide. The discussion guide will lead you as you help your kids explore what is God really like and how to know Him better, what He really thinks about us. We've made it super simple by providing conversation starters, fun activities, and takeaways for each session. The fun and engaging videos will spark conversation and provide one really big idea to discuss about a key Bible verse. Reclaim that time around the family dinner table, around the real God. I hope you'll check it out. Thanks, Chip. For more information and to download this free family devotional series, visit us online at livingontheedge.tv. That's livingontheedge.tv. While you're there, check out dozens of resources all created to help you be a Christian that really lives like a Christian.